Well, Brett, uh, thank, thank you. So we can start now because the time is for us to start. So um, the first, I think uh, you the best speaker around the world, which I can learn from the uh, YouTube and everything. But uh, maybe Cambodian's audience uh, do not know you uh, clearly. Can you uh, give a little bit of idea of who, who you are and why you're so, uh, you're so um, uh, knowledgeable and you can share your wisdom with the Cambodian audience today? Thank thank, you. Thank, thanks so much. Thanks for having me here. Um, I was born in a small hospital in Sicily 58 years ago, which I think is more detail than you need. Um, I, uh, I'm currently living in Tokyo. I am the deputy director of the Center for Rulemaking Strategies at Tama University, which is a think tank there that works on rulemaking strategies, which is an interesting concept. Right. I moved back to Tokyo after spending 17 years in Hawaii mm -hmm. running the Pacific Forum, which is a think tank that focuses on foreign affairs, Asia-Pacific policy, United States foreign policy, and was running international conferences, writing papers, doing the, the things that you know, consultants or folks that work on foreign policy right. do, traveling a lot as one does when one lives in Hawaii. Uh, and then prior to that, I had spent a decade in Tokyo again mm -hmm. in, as the, uh, an editorial writer for the Japan Times, which is the oldest and largest English language newspaper. My background uh, prior to that, I, I, I've gone to law school. I have gotten a master's in international affairs in Europe, no right. less. Asia is a new, uh, was a new field for me. And then I did all sorts of things that were interesting but not terribly productive. I was a musician. Right. I was a private detective. I right. uh, had lots of fun. But, but mostly now I spend my time trying to understand what's going on in this part of the world, right. trying to make sense of, of regional and, and dynamics and understand to the degree that we can what's happening right. and hopefully how to work in ways that make a, a better and more prosperous future for all of us. Right. I, I know that you were invited uh, to uh, join speak yesterday at the regional conference about the uh, Indo-Pacific, which is something very new uh, for Cambodia, which we uh, I'm not sure that if we all understand about that. And how how is that conference? Uh, how is that conference? Is it a fruitful conference? It was a very interesting conversation and an important conversation. Um, it, the, the conference was run by a CICP, which is a, a Cambodian think tank, uh, mm -hmm. Cambodian Institute for uh, Peace and, and, and Development, I believe, or, or I. I Peace and cooperation. Free, right. Yes, peace and cooperation, which actually I've known since it was set up a, a number of, of years ago. Mm -hmm. Its founder, Kihorn, I think, was, a, was, an, was an old friend. Right. Um, we were discussing, as you said, the Indo-Pacific, uh, which is, uh, don't feel bad if, if Cambodian people don't understand it. I think most people don't quite understand the concept. And uh, a lot of that is because it is a, uh, a project in the making. It's a, right. it's a concept that's evolving. But what it, I think what, to, to be really simple, uh, it reflects this understanding that this part of the world, whether we're talking about Southeast Asia or the East Asia or the Asia Pacific, or in this newer, larger incarnation, the Indo-Pacific, has become this extraordinary locus and this great source of, of economic dynamism and economic right. growth. And as such, it has become far, far more important right. to the United States. I mean, put quite simply, you know, for many, many years, the United States was an Atlantic power. We right. looked reflexively, if you will, from, from the East Coast to the, to across the Atlantic to Europe, and that's, that's where decisions were made in the world. Right. And now, since for the last 20, 25 years, we've seen the rise of Asia, not just mm -hmm. the rise of China. And right. I think it's really important. We talk a lot about China, but what distinguishes this era now from those which have come before it, because Japan rose in the 70s and 80s, right. and then you had the tigers rising in the 80s and 90s, right. and, and the dragons rising in the 80s and 90s, is now all of the region is coming up together. Right. And you know, interesting, Japan is coming out of its slump. China is rising. Yeah. Southeast Asia is rising. India, too, is, is, is an important piece of this. Right. And what we've come to understand is, is that this is a vitally, vitally important region, right. and it's a different region. It's not just Southeast Asia and Northeast Asia. Right. But in fact, we need to be looking at it more holistically, that there are the, the, the resources that fuel these economies, right. whether it is raw materials, whether it is energy, they're coming from Africa and the Middle East. Right. And thus, if we're really gonna think about this in, a, in I think an intelligent way, we have to put all those pieces together. And so that means we have to start thinking about the Indian Ocean right. as well as the Pacific Ocean. So we create this larger strategic space called the Indo-Pacific. Right. Is that, is that the idea behind that is uh, supposed to be a challenge with what China has called the One World One Road Initiative? Not necessarily. I mean, I think 
the conception of the Indo-Pacific, while the strategy and, right. and, and the articulation as U.S. policy is relatively new, the Trump administration has really adopted this pretty much since November of last year when then Secretary of State Tillerson gave this speech right. uh, at CSIS in Washington, a think tank, that talked about the Indo-Pacific and then it's been taken off ever since. But in fact, you see, I think, uh, 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 an understanding of these two oceans right. concept in this larger sphere. Really, you, know, you can trace it back to the 1980s or even further back if you wish, mm -hmm. but it takes real hard shape in the 1990s, right. it accelerates in the year 2000 and, and in, the, in the first decade of the century, so it really predates BRI. Mind you, I think the rise of China is a really important piece of this and we'll talk about right. it. So the degree to which China is seen as using the Belt and Road Initiative as a way of advancing its interests right and changing to some degree the rules of the game then it does become an important defining feature or something at least to as a marker but to say that it is a response to BRI or that even to say that it's a response to the rise of China right. I think is far far too simple right most of Asian, Asian people especially a country like Cambodia cannot avoid the China and always uh, want to be part of uh, China rising and all welcome with China or never say no to China but the country like Japan or Singapore probably a little bit concerned of China rising right Yes and no. I mean, I think like, I, I would stick to what you said. I think we all want China to rise because we've all benefited right. from China's rise. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, it, it's funny. The one of you know, a lot of people look at the Chinese rise and it's, if you will, the, the closing of the gap, right, between right. China's relative capabilities and those of the United States. On, on the economic front, people say that China is going to overtake the United States, say, in f 10 years, 15 years, maybe less. Uh, by some measures, it already has the economic size. The military is going to take longer, but it's getting more capable. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, as an American, I look at that right. as a source of pride. Because China has gotten wealthy, as did Japan, as did Germany, as did South Korea, as will and as is Cambodia, right. and other countries because the United States was one of the principal architects of an international system that said we want everybody right. to get wealthy. We want everyone as, uh, to say to get rich and fat and happy. We want a world of greater prosperity. Right. And we don't, you know, and thus that the gap that's closing, the fact that other countries are doing well, that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. Right. That is a, a measure of success. And so one of the interesting questions that we're debating in the Indo-Pacific and debating in terms of the international system more generally right. is as these successes occur, mm. other countries wish to be part of the rule-making system. And to what degree do they want to change the rules? Because as an American, you look at the system and the rules and the institutions right. of order, and we think, well, yeah, they benefit us, but they benefit you too. Why would you want to change the rules that have helped you so much? Right. Are you trying? Are you? Do you want to change them to to advantage you and to disadvantage other countries? Right. And that, to me, I mean, again, say what you will about the United States, but we've been, I think, pretty magnanimous, and we've done a pretty good job of making sure that, as we say, all boats rise together. Right. And that's an extraordinary accomplishment and an extraordinary mindset, and the one I think that we overlook a lot as right. we try to discuss these things. But one of the concerns that the, the world is seeing is today is worried about when the China rising, China becomes the superpower uh, uh, number one in the another uh, 25 or 30 year, which will hurt the world in terms of security or, um, and so on. Uh, what is your view, your view on that? I think that, that for a number of reasons that that really goes too far. Uh, not because China isn't, it doesn't have the potential to do great things, and I believe it does. Mm -hmm. Number one, you know, it assumes that everything that works in China will continue to work and it will stay on the path that it's on. Right. You know, there's an old saying, you know, China has 1.2 billion people. It used to be 1.3. 1.3, 1.2. Right. Take everything good in China and you divide it by 1.3 billion. Take everything bad in China and multiply it by 1.3 billion. China is a huge country and it faces... It's a continent. Right? It, 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 yes, it's a continent, right. best way to put it and it faces extraordinary challenges. 
And those challenges are being accentuated, right. sped up by the speed with which China's developing. And you know, the Chinese leadership since Deng Xiaoping has been amazing. Right. With you look at the hundreds of millions of people that have been lifted out of poverty. You know, and you, you meet Chinese students and you meet Chinese researchers and you know that they are capable of doing anything. The right. idea that China, you know, for years people said the Japanese can only sell radios. Right. That's right. nonsense. The Chinese can only put things together. That's nonsense too. Right. The Chinese are capable of building products, of doing things that, are, that will match the finest quality of any craftsman anywhere in the world. Right. I mean, you look at the number of patents, you look at the percentage of, of R&D spending, all of that suggests that the Chinese are capable of innovating, right. of growing. But nevertheless, it's right. a big country. Right. And there's a lot that can go wrong. Mm -hmm. And there is a lot of problems and tensions that are built into the system, not least of which, from an American perspective, right. of course, is the tensions that are created by the nature of the political system. And we can talk about that if you like. But right. the important point is, China, you know, has many reasons to wish it well, but to expect that there could be many bad things that happen in its future. So China could lose that, could, right. could lose that trajectory, or even if it flattens out. Right. So that, that's the first point. The second, however, which I think is equally important, is that you know, China's going to get rich, and China's going to find that there are, uh, you know, th th that doesn't mean, to my mind, that it supplants the United States. Right. Right? That, and you said China is going to be a superpower. I think China is becoming a great power. I think China has a long way to go to become a superpower. Even when it overtakes the United States, if it does, it's the largest economy in the world. Right. The fact of the matter is, it's the largest economy because it's so big, literally in terms right. of size, in terms of population. So you know, the Chinese will spread that extraordinary economic growth and wealth across a much larger body of people. Right. The average standard of living in the United States will stay high. I mean, you go to Shanghai, I presume you do. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's a phenomenal city. I love going to Shanghai. And there's right. my, it, it, I could be in New York. I could be in Tokyo in some places. Right. And then I walk off the street, and I could be in Western China. It, 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 you know, there's these disparities. Right. And the larger, you know, so the point is, is that just because it's got the formal indices, right? It's right. the economy's this big, mm -hmm. and, and GDP is this, and it has these aircraft carriers, doesn't mean that it's a superpower. But it is a big country, and it is likely to be a regional great power, right. and it will have global interests. Right. So as I look at a country that's got those interests that are spread around the world, I think, well, it's right that China have the means to defend them okay. and to look out at them. So I don't... That's a, that's a, that's a great point. So um, let's uh, talk a little bit about the, uh, the ASEAN. Um, sure. How, how, the, how the ASEAN can, take the, can absorb the, uh, the benefit or take advantage from, the, uh, from China rising and the, also the China and U.S. competition in Asia? I think ASEAN's doing a good job of that already, right? right. Insofar as it is, it, it insists as you know and as, as the viewers know on this principle of ASEAN centrality that if you wish to engage the region, you engage through ASEAN, you engage through its governments, you engage through its institutions. Right. And China's doing that. And of course, ASEAN has been smart enough to recognize you bring everybody in. So you don't, you don't just deal with China, but you deal with the Americans too. Right. You bring with the Japanese and you bring ASEAN the Australians. Three, ASEAN plus and market. you bring, right, right, all Indian. of those dialogue partners. Right. Because why? Because then you can go, well, China wants to offer me X, Mm -hmm. Japan's going to offer me why. It gives you a little elbow room. It allows you to right. negotiate and bargain. That's really wise. But I think that what is, from my point of view, one of the most important things that ASEAN could be doing right. and is not doing yet, though. What is, is that? It, yeah, you see? <laughs> one of the most important things that I think ASEAN should be doing is, is that it should be more quicker to call China out when it acts in ways that undermine ASEAN interests. Now, this is difficult, I grant you. ASEAN, the, the principles of unanimity, of ASEAN right. consensus, all of that makes it very hard in the absence of, a, of, an, of an agreement by all 11 of the ASEAN right. the 10. I, I, Everyone was over the conference was referring to the ASEAN 11. It was Timor Leste. Yes, probably uh, including with the- um, Timor Leste. Uh, Timor Leste. Right. right. So, and I, what I think, ASEAN has to do, though, is it has to start from the premise that I talked about originally, right. which is ASEAN has benefited greatly from this world that we have, right. that we, from a system that is ruled by laws, 
that it believes in equal opportunity for all, right. where we believe in free and open trade, hopefully. I mean, there is room for different forms of democracy, I will grant you, that, that American political systems are not always the best, right. are not, and, and need not be adopted by every country. But I do think that democracy, respect for the individual, human rights, which are, by the way, enshrined both in, in the right. ASEAN agreements and the United, States, United Nations Charter, all of those which are agreements that we've all signed up to, those are important components of just, of human dignity. And yeah. I think that ASEAN would do well to call out Beijing well, and the United States right. when it acts in ways that undermine, subvert, or otherwise weaken right. those, you know, those rules, those norms, and to make sure that all of us are continue to benefit. But the, the problem for ASEAN now, because ASEAN is not one war yet, because they still call the, the old ASEAN and young ASEAN, yes. old ASEAN and the rich ASEAN. So the ASEAN five, the ASEAN founder, uh, founder they're so mm -hmm. great. And the ASEAN young, like Cambodian, Laos, and Myanmar, or Vietnam, is still far away. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, there is a, a difference is uh, the ASEAN, uh, uh, Cambodia, uh, democracy, uh, Vietnam is communist, or uh, Laos is communist, whatever. They still have a different, different languages, different cultures. And uh, a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of things that are still uh, still not uh, fixing, but sure. they are have a common interest. Yes. And and also you think that these ASEAN leader these days can achieve whatever they want because what I what I see uh, during the Lee Kuan Yew time 50 years ago, ASEAN was great and keep the prosperity and the uh, peaceful and security. But do you think the um, ASEAN? Uh, 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 for the next 50 years, next 50 years, will ASEAN uh, keep remain peaceful, security, and, pro and prosper under leadership of the current leader of the world of the 11 country? Well, I mean, there is something to be said about the generation of leadership in the world today. Uh, that I mean, you look back at, at, at people like Lee Kuan Yew. Right. You look back at at at, at uh, Mahathir at that time. Or I mean, Mahathir was. I mean, uh, say what he was. He was. He was a very determined and visionary leader. He was infuriating. I remember he used to drive the Americans crazy back right. in the 1990s. But mm -hmm. this was a man, I mean, he was, uh, you know, and, and, and not just in ASEAN. I mean, you can look at people like uh, Kakuei Tanaka. Right. You know, you can look at Kim Dae-jung. You can look at Deng Xiaoping, frankly. Right. I mean, these were men that understood truly historical forces. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the demands for a number of reasons, the, Domestic politics these days is very different. Right. So it is a lot harder. But I still think that, that you know, you're not asking that everyone toe the certain line that we take a policy of this or a policy of that. But I think it, it, what we are suggesting, or what my belief would be, is, is that you should be able to defend the larger norms of the system. Right. Respect for the rule of law. Right. That when, it, when, it, when it, an international tribunal issues a ruling, that is respected by everyone that we actually acknowledge that. Right. Um, that, that when we sign up to international treaties or when we sign up to you know, international organizations, we respect the rules of those organizations right. and live and practice and, and develop policies that are in accordance with that. Right. Um, and you know, it's, there is invariably the difficulties of marrying abstract principles to right. practice concrete of politics. But you know, it, it's um, it is difficult, I right. think. But we have to acknowledge that transparency tends to be a good thing, right? T transparency lets us know, you know, if the idea is that we all wish to share in the wealth, that right. we all wish to make decisions mm -hmm. that are actually an accurate and the best decisions for our country, we need to know the facts. Right. We need to know that when a contract is made, what the actual value of the assets are. Right. Who's being paid for what? where the money is going. Transparency. Yeah. Exactly. And I, I think it, that it's easy when you're the, the interests of a small group mm. that generally benefit from the opacity are, are come at the expense of the interests of the larger, you know, the public. Right. And so it, I, we would hope that we would live in a world in which or we would be able to op exercise the opportunities to mm. demand that transparency, demand that concurrent concordance right. with the law, both domestic and international. And it seems like that's not too much to ask. Right. Uh, can we talk a little bit about the South China Sea? Sure. Uh, um, uh, what's going on uh, these days? Because the Philippines bring China go to the court, and uh, Cambodia in 2012 was not an uh, issue. The, um, uh, 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 the, the, 
the, uh, the, uh, the joint statement that's very criticizing around the world. Um, people saying that Cambodia sleep with China, not sleep with ASEAN. And, and what's going on until these days? Well, I mean, the, the most important development these days is, is twofold. Mm -hmm. The first, of course, is the discussions on the code of conduct and the, right. and the progress that's being made on that. Right. I, I hope, I mean, from what I've seen, there are some troubling pieces of that, uh, the, 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 um, the provisions that suggest that only uh, countries that are part of the, the signatories of, of the code of conduct right. would thus be able to participate in either military exercises or exploration of resources. Uh, it seems to me to be a violation of some very fundamental principles of international right. law. These are international waterways and those right. 11 countries, it may be in their region, but they don't get to make those decisions according to international law. Right. So the fate of that particular negotiation is a very important one. Then there is, of course, the larger question of just uh, the nature of Chinese behavior in the South China Sea, the creation of these artificial islands, right. uh, the militarization of those articles uh, of those uh, of those items, um, the degree, the fact that they are, by all standards of international law, illegal. They they are um, they shouldn't be there. Right. I am um, quite honestly. Uh, and, and I have, I, I, when I talk to my, my friends in the navies of the world, whether it's the Japanese or the, or the Americans, this is a somewhat controversial position. Mm. But I'm a little less concerned, frankly, about these islands in the sense that, you know, they, they represent blatantly illegal acts. Right. But I'm not sure to what degree they change, you know, the balance of power in the region. Now, China can choose to put right. military placements on them. Right. But if the Chinese decide <coughs> that they want to then use that to somehow or other change its neighbors, to, to, to influence the behavior, to, if you will, coerce them in right. the decisions they make, well, then it strikes me that ASEAN no longer has to make a very clear decision. Is are we going to continue to ignore Chinese behavior when it directly affects us? Right. When what we've done essentially is given China the means to intimidate and coerce us right. and to sh force us to do the things that we don't want to. China always want to have bilateral discussion, any problem China want to be one, one to one, do not want to have the ASEAN in a group to have a void there. That, right. is, that is the problem. Right, I mean, to me, the quintessential statement, I mean, the Chinese talk about the five principles of good neighborliness and, and cooperation and all that, but, right. and that's true, and they keep throwing that out. We heard that in our, our conference over the weekend, and I'm sure that there are times when the Chinese believe that that is, in fact, Mm -hmm. what it is, they're, they're, the, the, what, how they practice their foreign policy. Right. But I think, truthfully, the more realistic statement, an accurate statement of Chinese foreign policy was what the Foreign Minister Yan Jiechi said in 2010 at the ARF meeting, right? right? And he said, there are big countries and there are small countries. And China is a big country and that's a fact. And that is, I think, the very, the, 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 the base statement of Chinese right. practice of foreign policy, which is, China is China. It is bigger than everyone else. It has a longer history. It right. is the Middle Kingdom. And thus, in matters of dispute, China's interests are the most important, and therefore they deserve deference. And that, that to me, is the fundamental shift in between a United States worldview and a Chinese worldview. Right. I mean, the United States likes its friends, and we like to have our influence. Right. But I don't think we're ever that crude or that naked in the, in right. the exercise of power. We, too, are constrained by international law. Right. And we, too, are constrained by the United Nations. Right. Is it that um, when China, you talk about China behavior, China Institute and China uh, growing their muscle, uh, is, is there any concern or any threat to the, to the region and to the world, to the globe, because of China uh, becomes strong in and, and both economy and military? Uh, you, you see any sign of the threat into the region and the globe? Well, uh, yes. Uh, to the region more than the globe. I, I think China, again, this goes back to you, you called China a superpower. I think China is just a regional power thus right. far. It is increasingly acquiring global interests. Right. But uh, China, you know, China has one aircraft carrier and it's building its second one. The United States has 11. Thailand has an aircraft carrier. Right. Spain has an aircraft carrier. Having an aircraft carrier does not seem to me to be this extraordinary statement of throwing your weight around in the world. Right. Um, but the issue really becomes, as China becomes more wealthy, right. and as China becomes more powerful, what is it 
that we, and by we, it's not just the United States. This is not a competition between the United States and China. And I would argue it is a competition between all of the countries, to go back to my original point, right. that believe that the system that emerged after World War II and has worked to all of everyone's benefit, to what degree are they prepared right. to make changes in ways to accommodate the rise of China and, let's face it, the rise of India right. and the rise of what well, we say, the rise of the rest, whether we're talking about Brazil. I mean, they call you know, the, the BRICS is there for a reason. Right. There does need to be an accommodation right. in the international system to a redistribution of wealth and right. power, of wealth and thus of power. Right. And the international system has lagged in making that adjustment. Right. But the question becomes, do we change it a little bit? Do we change it a lot? What changes do we make? Right. And I think it is a mistake to say that it is up to the United States or the United States and Europe to make those adjustments. Right. It, it is all countries, including Cambodia, including Australia, Japan, Vietnam. Right. All countries that have a stake in the system need to make their views known as well. Okay. We have another two minutes and then we go to be break for the first session. But sure. before that, I have one more question for sure. you. How is the difference between the uh, uh, um, uh, President Trump's administri administration and the Barack Obama administration in the uh, Asia uh, foreign policy? Well, so, I, I think there's two. There's two. It's, true two, it's a right. great question. We're probably not going to get all of it in. But I think right. the quick answer in the yeah. two minutes that we've got. I mean, as you know, the rhetoric, in fact, we talked about an Indo-Pacific region in the Obama years. Right. The concept, if you will, of the Indo-Pacific existed in the rebalance in, in, uh, that, that, uh, that President Obama talked about. Right. So without question, the idea that we are bringing the Indian Ocean into these strategic calculations, mm -hmm. the Pacific Command, which has just been renamed the Indo-Pacific Command, yeah. right? always went, as, as Admiral Harris, the, the, the just the recently um, uh, recently retired Pacific commander, used to say, you know, his brief went from Bollywood to Hollywood. That's, that's the Indo-Pacific. Right. So conceptually, there's not a lot of difference. What we're seeing, I think, in terms of difference, though, is process. And a lot of this reflects the fact that this is an administration that is largely inexperienced. Right. Uh, is very understaffed at this point. And they're still trying to get up to speed. And then, of course, and maybe this is a good place to take a break, there's the singular character of the president himself. And so he brings a very unique worldview right. to the White House and thus to the American policymaking process. Okay, thank you so much. So now it's time for breaks, uh, five minutes, and then we can uh, continue more um, after break. Thank Fine. you so much. Thank you much. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> ជាកម្មវិធីថ្មីវិទ្យាដ៏បោះទន្ទោអនឡាញថ្មែកថាមដែលផ្ដល់សំខាន់នៅកិច្ចពិភាក្សាស៊ីជំរៅចំពោះន
ังวิธีชุมบุญในเศรษฐกิจหรือหาถา Business Insight คือจีการวิธีไม่วิติดระบบตุนตัวออนไลน์ทำไม่ทำแต่ก็ต้องสำคัญเป็นเกิดเปียสาซีจุมเรือจมพูนนีกาในการวิวัฒน์เติมในเศรษฐกิจจุมดุ้ยในการวินิจฉัยนองดมบอนนังปีพบโลกกับวิธีนี้ในพระราชพรมินก็ดูชิปปิบันไทม์ดอตุสนิกจุนทุเรจุนนังวิธีจกกันจีดนังอันตรจีดนับไปงี้สุลขนมกาสมรจิตปุ่งริกอาชีวกรรมนังวิธีจกบันไทม์นองเปรียจินิจักกัมพูชีกับวิธีจุงมวยในเศรษฐกิจมิสไซจุนเทศนาเรียงรถไฮซ็อกวิลเลียมองปรำใบปรึกคือจีการเป็นที่ไม่มีติดระบบตุนตัวออนไลน์ทำไม่ทำแต่ก็ต้องสำคัญเป็นเกิดเปียสาซีจุมเรือจมพูนนีกาในการวิวัฒน์เติมในเศรษฐกิจจุมดุ้ยในการวินิจฉัยนองดมบอนนังปีพบโลกกับวิธีนี้ในพระราชพรมินก็ดูชิปปิบันไทม์ดอตุสนิกจุนทุเรจุนนังวิธีจกกันจีดนังอันตรจีดนับไปงี้สุลขนมกาสมรจิตปุ่งริกอาชีวกรรมนังวิธีจกบันไทม์นองเปรียจินิจักกัมพูชีกำบิธีจุงมวยในเศรษฐกิจมิสไซจุนเทศนาเรียงรถไฮซ็อกวิลเลียมองปรำใบปรึก All right, so we can uh, continue with the um, Trump and Obama policy, uh, different administration. Can you continue a little bit on that? Sure. I think there are, I think, two really important and related differences uh, that that really vital between Mr. Trump and Mr. Obama, and they they are the first is that. The Obama administration, the rebalances it was known, we know three rebalances really. Right. One was a rebalance globally that, that would shift the center of attention from, the, like I said, the Atlantic world to the Asian world. And this is a tripolar order. Mm. Second was the implicit notion that we had gotten Northeast Asia right. pretty right, and so we needed to pay more attention to Southeast Asia. Right. And that was very important. The third piece was there was a sense that the U.S. military was overweighted. In our engagement, in other words, we were relying far, far too much on the military as the instruments of American power and presence right. in the region. So instead, what you saw was a real concerted effort to play up the diplomatic and the economic forms of engagement. Right. And you know, there was a lot of rhetoric about this, and to be truthful, the administration was less effective in right. making it real, but it talked properly. You know, so you set up the new ASEAN ambassador. The U.S. was the first country, I think, to do that. Right. We set up the U.S. ASEAN Business Council. We set up the, the exchanges, the diplomatic exchanges with the young leaders right. and the young folks next generation, which was really good. And I think equally importantly is, the, is one of the expressions of the economic engagement right. was the effort to join the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Mm -hmm. And I think that was really, really vital. It was a sense then not just in response to China, but this notion that as this region was emerging as a real locus of global power, right. and given the slowdown that was occurring in global trade negotiations, that at a time maybe Asia could be leading in this. And so, I think Mr. Mr. Obama working with Japanese Prime Minister Abe, exactly. working with with the various uh, John Howard among others, Kevin Rudd in uh, uh, Australia. in Australia. Yeah. Right. It was it was a chance to create a new. Gold standard for international trade, and so right. the TPP emerged, and then, uh, unfortunately, and this is where I would really fault the Obama administration: they didn't take it to the bank. They did not push hard enough right. to make it real and to get it passed and ratified before the elections, etc. And thus, uh, you had, of course, Mr. Trump in his first day, first week of office, pulling, as, as per his pledge. Pulled the United States out of TPP. Right. And that was a great loss. I mean, it, was a, it was a terrible mistake um, in my mind. But that's related not only to the economic engagement, and you haven't then, you know, Mr. Trump said that he would be following up that up with a bunch of great trade deals bilateral. We haven't seen them yet. I mean, thus right. far we've bogged down in the NAFTA rene renegotiations. There's been some talk 
about, uh, I mean, there's been some renegotiations to create a U.S. trade agreement, right. but I understand they have not actually been put into place. And then, of course, all the trade spats, particularly those revolving around China, which we can talk about. Right. But this also reflects, I think, a, 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 a suspicion in the Trump administration right. about multilateralism and a great discomfort. He, too, I think, would like to put himself in a position where he can reuse U.S. superior size and strength to its right. advantage in negotiating. So that's that a preference for bilateralism. That's that's an important He only He only achieves the China stealing job from uh, from American. Yes. Uh, is that true? Is, how, how is the uh, Chinese My, stealing job from American? Well, I mean, the <laughs> argument would be um, the crudest, crudest version of all of that is right. the fact that Chinese workers are cheaper and therefore what you do is you American capital will quit uh, right. uh, building uh, whatever manufacturing in the United States where it has to pay its workers $15 an hour and instead will go to China and pay its workers $3 an hour or right. whoever else. And that's a, a crude simplification because there are all sorts of other effects that follow. You know, when China's going to build a, a, uh, a plant, what it, the, the, the machines and right. the materials that it makes, that it builds the plant with it gets from the United States. Right. So there is all sorts of other, and then the, the services that are developed to, to create international agreements, the contracts, all the, you know, the United States is, is exceeds in many, much of that. Right. So this, this <coughs> simplistic notion, if you will, that it merely the bringing China into the global trade system has resulted in the loss of American jobs is overly simplistic. Right. There are academics, we have to admit, there's academic research that shows that China, since it joined the WTO, that there have been sufficient trade losses. But I think right. that reflects a number of factors, not just China's entry into the WTO, but the degree to which, number one, that China actually abides by WTO rules. Right. And if, in fact, China was compliant with WTO policy, whether or not you would see some of these, these changes occur. Right. And secondly, though, is a, a political economy in the United States that says we're really not allowed to spend money to help train people and to help workers that lose their jobs. And so I think there's a there's a second piece of this puzzle that we, we fail to address. Right. But um, so th the crude simplification that China is costing Americans jobs, I think is just that, a crude simplification. Right. But in the uh, uh, um, President Trump's administration, we can see some progress on international uh, uh, issue, <coughs> for example, he can having a deal with the uh, uh, Kim Jong Un is uh, North Korea, and uh, there is no uh, no war uh, like in the Middle East during Obama time. Uh, there is uh, Middle East is like a burned down. And uh, uh, be run careful. Run. There's there's a uh, lot of war going on in the Middle East right now. I mean, uh, okay. uh, I mean in Syria you've got a still, horrific crisis. That, that can't come continue from Obama, right? Well, I mean, it started then, but it seems Sorry. to be intensifying in some cases. The right. fighting that's going on in Yemen. I mean, I would. The Middle East is no not just as very peaceful and calm place right now. And in fact, okay. I would be very concerned, truthfully, for, right. from my vantage point. I'm not a, a Middle Eastern expert. Right. But I am a little bit concerned that the, right. um, the that we are going to see with decisions that have been made in terms of the negotiations between Israelis and Palestinians, the decision to move the U.S. capital to Jerusalem, right. the decision to cut off funding for the, the several hundred million dollars of the Palestinians which right. have been made in the last few weeks, and to close the, the Palestinian uh, embassy in Washington, all of those are going to come back in ways that, that may will make the situation much worse. So I just mm -hmm. I just yeah. take issue. Yeah, with yes, that. good, good, good to uh, good to know that because a little bit concerned for us because uh, Asia, especially ASEAN, it looked like the area where have more peaceful in the world today, and we don't want to see uh, the the war uh, spread it from the Middle East throw uh, into the uh, the uh, the ASEAN uh, well, the nation. So there's a little bit concerned, but sort of. I think there's a good reason to be concerned. Yeah. I think that you know the defeat of ISIS in, in Syria and Iraq has been important. But there are real questions, and this is not something, to be very honest, I've paid a lot of attention to lately. But I right. know there is a concern that many of the fighters that had gone off to join ISIS that had come from this part of the world are now coming back. Right. And so there's some concern about whether or not you will see Islamic rise in Islamic extremism right. you know, out of, out of some of the, 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 the Muslim triangles in, in, in uh, the Philippines, right. maybe in some of the unexplored spaces of Malaysia. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, Perhaps even there's, there's concern about growing intolerance in, 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 in Indonesia as well. Right. So I think there is a, a, an issue that the, the, the problem for this region is going to be, in some respects, uh, the, the return of ISIS-trained fighters and right. how, how 
the potential for destabilization there. Then now there's a whole other range of security issues we could talk about if you right. wish. But you know, I think also it is worth mentioning. Um, I am frankly a skeptic about uh, the prospects for peace in North Korea. Um, but I think we should give the president credit for having right. broken a logjam and created perhaps, perhaps the conditions for peace in ways that have not existed in many, many, many years. Right. I do not know, and frankly, I'm very uh, pessimistic about the possibilities, but I hope it works out well. Right. Can you give us a, a little bit about the um, uh, unified, the uh, reunified between the North and the South, uh, Korea, well, uh, this is the addition and, and Exactly. Georgia, right? right. And, so and it's I mean, a good move, right? Yeah. Um, yes and no. I mean, you yes know, no. the, the <laughs> famous saying, a talk talk is always better than, or jaw jaw is better than war war. Right. So that's, that's always an important uh, reminder. I mean, there are two fundamental questions about North Korea or about the Korean Peninsula or two and, and two tracks. One of them of course is the conversation between North Korea and South Korea on the terms of their relationship and the degree to which we are going to see the continuation of two separate Korean governments right. or whether we will move towards a unifi unified Korean Peninsula and on what terms. Right. And, and you know the South Korean people uh, should be along with the North Koreans the, the drivers and the architects of that process. Right. They are, it is about them. However, at the same time, and one of the greatest impediments to the unification of the Korean Peninsula is North Korea's possession of nuclear weapons. And you know, North Korea will claim that it has these weapons because they feel threatened right. by the Americans. Right. And thus, if they are not threatened, that they will give them up. And if they give them up, then that, of course, increases the prospects for or changing the relationship with the United States, for the region, and for making then unification of North and South Korea. The fear that the Americans have right. is that in this process of negotiation, that the language that North Korea uses, it talks about the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Now, you and I look at the Korean Peninsula and say one country has nuclear weapons on the Korean Peninsula and that is North Korea. There are no United States nuclear weapons on the Korean Peninsula. There have not been for 25 years. Right. We do not deploy our weapons on the Korean Peninsula. Um, and South Korea has none. So if you wish to denuclearize the Korean Peninsula, it's very simple. Right. North Korea gives up its nuclear weapons. However, of course, the North Koreans say they, they need them for protection. It is not clear when the North Koreans say we wish to denuclearize, they mean, we think, some of us think, that that means they want the Americans to eliminate their nuclear weapons, to remove the threat of a nuclear attack against North Korea. And that means to them, you have to eliminate the alliance with the United States. You have to eliminate the, the guarantee of the United States, what we call the extended deterrent, that if South Korea is attacked by the North, the United States will defend them. Right. And if need be, we will defend them with nuclear weapons. That's part of the guarantee. Right. The North Koreans, in theory, have also said they worry about the U.S. alliance with Japan, and that thus the United States would have to cultural, end that alliance. Cultural conflict. Yeah. Right. That they could, we have to end that alliance. We have to end that nuclear guarantee. Some cases they say, well, you have to pull your nuclear weapons out of Guam as well. So it's not clear what North Korea means. And the fear among many skeptics mm -hmm. is that North Korea s says one thing and it le is interpreted another way. So the U.S. mind never believed what the Kim Jong-un had promised. So in far. Well, in many cases, many people say what Kim Jong-un has promised is not what he, what he says is not what he's promised, right. if you will. And Mr. Trump seems to think that he struck a special deal right. with Mr. Kim, and that therefore he's made a promise to him. Other people say, if you look historically, Mr. Kim or his father or his grandfather right. has used the exact same words and made a very similar promise and not kept them. Right. Now, the North Koreans will also say that the Americans have not kept their promises in the past. Mm -hmm. So we're at this moment where if what you look at came out of the agreement that was reached in Pyongyang just the other day, yesterday actually, yesterday, yesterday yeah. life goes so fast. The agreement that was reached in yesterday said we are going to, for example, give up. We will dismantle right. this missile testing facility in front of international observers. Well, the truth is North Korea has already supposedly dismantled that facility. They've already said that. The, the, the new part of that deal is, is that in front of international observers. Right. So it's not clear that that's a new promise, that he's doing anything that he said he, w he hasn't already done. Right. And 
He says he's already developed his nuclear weapon, so he doesn't need that testing facility. So right. in other words, he's given up something that means nothing. And then the second sentence after that is, and we are prepared to, di to dismantle the Yongbyon, which is a nuclear processing facility, if the United States does other things as well. Right. The question is, what is it that they want? And most people think that what they want the United States to do is they want the, to issue a statement that declares the end of the war. The war, the Korean War, which ended in 1953, right. has never had a peace treaty. To this day, there is what an armistice. Right. So the question becomes, one, you know, is what, do they get a declaration of war, which is not a peace treaty, but it would change the situation and would be, as far as the North Koreans are concerned, a genuine statement that the United States is interested right. in changing our relationship and changing the way that the, the Northeast Asian the political dynamics but, were. But, but frankly, uh, the question is, where does the United States want to see that the two uh, country, uh, the two brothers are together or uh, wish to see they are uh, separately? No, I, I mean, no. I think it, it is, we would like to see unification. And right. we would like to see unification with, you know, I frankly, I personally think that North Korean government is a, is a dictatorship that has hundreds of thousands of people in, in, uh, in education camps and, and right. you know, does treats them terribly. Right. So I would prefer to see, truthfully, if you're going to have a unified Korea, it under mm -hmm. a Seoul government, a democratic government, than under the Kim, Jong Kim dynasty. Right. But the question is, is that if, for example, we provide a peace declaration, mm -hmm. will North Korea then say, then there's no reason for you to have American forces in North Korea, er, in Korea as well? Right. Does that provide, if you will, the, 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 the opening steps? Right by which you unravel mm -hmm. the American commitment to South Korean security. And then the fear right. is, is that North Korea still has nuclear weapons, South Korea does not, and South Korea does not have a, a, an ally to defend itself. And then, at that moment, North Korea is able to unify the peninsula right. on its terms, mm -hmm. and thus you know, it, 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 it accomplishes its, it, its, well, it, its, its desires. Now, there's another piece of that, too, which is, the Japanese are very concerned, Japanese, yeah. and the Japanese are our allies. And the Japanese are very unhappy with the prospect of a North Korea with nuclear weapons and the United States that is okay with that. Right. So you have a... a so Japan see the most threat from the North Korea. I think there are many South Koreans that feel a very, very great threat too, right. but the Japanese are very worried, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, what's the role of China at this stage with the um, uh, Korean Peninsula um, issue? Well, China has a very important role to play. Number okay. one, it has been the source of 90% of North Korea's economic exchange in the last few years. At, uh, right. uh, so, in many ways, China provides the, the lifeline and is really the primary conduit for trade, for economic activity, for business activity. Number right. two, it is, you know, for many years, China and North Korea were allies. So, you know, the famous saying was, we're as close as lips and teeth. Right. And so China provided the diplomatic cover right. for North Korea, uh, whether it was in the event, that it, in theory, it protected it against an attack by the United States and South right. Korea, which was never going to happen, but it was available, so it offered some security. And it provides diplomatic cover at the United Nations with Russia. Right. So as you know, there's a belief in the United States that North Korean behavior has been so bad that we have to impose economic sanctions. Right. And, the, and the, the pressure of those sanctions is what forced North Korea to make these deals or to begin the negotiating process with President Trump and with President Moon in South Korea. If, if China no longer make up the uh, North Korea, oh, okay. that U.S. very easy to talk to uh, North Korea directly. Right. And the argument would be that, one, again, that because China was backing the sanction, sanctions last year and the years before, the pressure was so profound on right. Kim Jong-un that he had to negotiate. So the concern now is, and that, so that's what brought him to the table to make this deal, if right. we accept its deal. Now, China says, well, you know, we're moving forward. Let's ease the pressure because for a number of reasons we go into. China doesn't like to pressure North Korea. Right. And then now North Korea says, well, the pressure's off. Let's keep our nuclear weapons. And in that world, uh, you, you don't have progress. So China plays a very negative and positive role. That right. if it doesn't choose to enforce the UN sanctions, 
life in North Korea is much, much easier. Right. So um, talk a little bit about the alliance of the uh, U.S.-Japan, uh, uh, um, uh, because I talked to some of the Japanese experts in, in Bangkok uh, two weeks ago. They have uh, show a little bit concerned about the, the attitude of the Donald Trump. They want to work with uh, whatever Amer American have uh, before, right? right? So Donald Trump administ administration uh, make the uh, Japan, Jap Japan's uh, uh, expert feel that they uh, they maybe one day is going to be uh, broke uh, the alliance. Yeah. You think any sign? I think there are reasons to be concerned. I wouldn't worry about breaking the alliance yet. But I mean, the fact of the matter is, you know, when Donald Trump won the election in November of 2016, Japanese were like everyone shocked. And I can't, you know, all my friends in Japan and the government and whatever, and everyone was getting our phone calls. Who, who do you know in the Trump administration, the Trump team, that right. we can talk to to find out about this guy? You remember? So Abe goes before Trump is inaugurated in December 2016 to Trump Tower. Right. And that caused a, a bit of shock, but it was understandable. And Mr. Trump, uh, and Mr. Abe went to long ways to make right. himself, to build a personal relationship with Mr. Trump. And he succeeded for a long time. Right. He set the gold standard. Mm -hmm. And he was there always offering advice, always offering him support. Uh, mm he -hmm. was a very close partner. Right. But the problem has got to be that, that uh, for M Donald Trump has changed in the 30-something years that he's been a public right. figure since the 1980s. His views, right. yeah, at one point he was even a Democrat, right? So he's changed his views on almost everything. The one thing he has always argued and always believed in and always said was that Japan is an unfair trader. Back in the 1980s, he was calling for measures against Japan. And he's just stuck with that to this day. So the fear that the Japanese have always had right. is at one point Mr. Trump will wake up and suddenly say, it's time for me, it's time for that trade fight with the Japanese and for us to settle the scores and to get back to, you know, take it to, 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 to right this relationship that doesn't work well. Right. And, you know, the Japanese have, I think, made a powerful case that, that they can help in other ways, et cetera, and have not, um, you know, have been waiting. And increasingly in recent months, as Mr. Trump has become more uh, mm. aggressive, I think, in his trade policies, right. they've become concerned that, Mr. Trump is going, you know, the, the fact that he's imposed the tariffs, the 232 tariffs, which are on national security, 301 tariffs on steel and right. aluminum, you know, the Japanese thought that as a partner and ally they would get an exemption. They did not. Nobody, very few countries have, so that's kind of, right. it's not there, the, but they're still offended by that, understandably. So, I'm sorry, just to finish. Yeah. So, the concern is, is that they're going to find themselves at, at, at that Trump is going to push for a uh, uh, you know free trade negotiations because that's what he likes these, these right. bilateral deals and that as that happens if the Japanese stand up for themselves they will be punished as the Canadians are being punished for example. Right. It's talking about a Japanese stand up and ja as is, is Japanese is going to be a stand up in also including the military and uh, not only uh, defend uh, him, uh, self defend but also it could be uh, set up um, a new military um, uh, themselves, chain constitution or something. Then no. Is there any chance no, that, yeah. right. that, that, that uh, yeah. the Japanese okay. do that? This is, I say this to the audience. Um, right. The answer is no, but right. to get the best answer for this, you should buy my book, which is going to come out about the future of Japan, which will come out next spring. The Japan... It's okay. called, the the uh, book is called Peak Japan, but it okay. will come out okay. next spring, right. so it's my plug. Um, but I think the answer is we don't understand, we, most people don't understand Japanese politics very well. Right. And I mean, yes, Prime Minister Abe believes that Japan should be a more responsible nation, that it should be doing more in the world, right. that it should change its constitution that would allow its military to have less restrictions. Right. But the fact is, if you look historically, while, the, mm. while Japan has, since Abe has been in power, and in fact over a 15-year period, loosen some of the constraints on its international security policy. The fact that it, it participated in the f refueling of the, the forces in Afghanistan during right. Operation Enduring Freedom, that was uh, quite forward-leaning. I mean, to be honest, the first time Japan really became forward-leaning on international security policy was here, 15 right. or 25 years ago, when you had the, the transition with the, the, the United Nations Peace, Peace. Right. right, and and Ambassador Akashi, who was running that program, yeah, you know, the Japanese it. began to stand their peacekeepers. Right. That's when it started. So you've had a gradual progression, and, mm. and and that continues to some degree. The larger issue to me, however, is that if the Japanese are becoming a little more right. conscious of their need to make an international or to contribute to security affairs. When it comes to hard security, what they really want to do is do more to defend Japan. Mm -hmm. They're not going to be sending their forces out far from home to, to engage in militaristic right. behavior. They're still very restricted in terms of their cooperation and peacekeeping operations. Right. 
And there is, quite frankly, no appetite in the Japanese public for that. Right. There is some for being, for taking care of themselves, for being responsible. But the Japanese people as well. Japan is the oldest country in the world, grayest country by the meaning right. the average age is oldest. It will continue to get older. Its population is going to shrink by right. almost a quarter over the next 20 years. Right. Um, pensions are going to be difficult. You know, it's going to be, we like to say, choices between guns and butter, right? Do you, do you, do you build a plant or do you build a, a tank, right? right? The Japanese are going to have to choose between guns and wheelchairs. Right? Do they do they fund their military, or are they going to provide health care for an increasingly right. old population? You, you you wrote a book about the uh, Japan <coughs> and Korea uh, yes. clash, right? Yes. That is probably identity uh, clash. Uh, identity clash. Is that is that um, um, the, the the conflicts the class will be uh, continue in the both uh, country society, or one day is is going to be one? Uh, for example, if uh, China is so strong and the Japan, uh, Japan and, and, and U.S. alliance getting slower or smaller, and then Japan go back to China and Korea and South Korea, look, we are old uh, friend, then we will come back to build up our side society. You know, it's interesting. I mean, what, what the book argues that Japan's conception of itself, its identity, its right. national identity, and the Korean conception of national identity are very much they're in opposition to each other. Right. That Koreans believe that they are a shrimp among whales, a small country, a lot like Cambodia, as I've heard. Right. You know, we're at the mercy of greater powers. Mm -hmm. That we are, you know, and, and that who we are as a country, you know, very much of this is a, is been defined by the colonial exploitation by the Japanese. Right. Now, and so we need Japan to be the bad guy in our lives, right? Mm. On the Japanese side, the Japanese have evolved since 1945 as well, a victim narrative. That after World while, War II, yeah. Right, that, that after World War II, that they too were, they were the only country to be uh, atom bombed. That they were, you know, suffered because their military got out of control and took control right. of the government. And that the people, the Japanese, were suffered. And they continue to suffer for this history that they're blamed with. So Korea calling Japan a bad guy threatens that narrative. So the two identities are in clash. Mm. Now, my argument and the argument from the book, and that of my co-author Scott Snyder, right. is that what has to happen is they need to move beyond that and to think ahead, look to the future rather than to the past. Right. And they need to think strategically. Right. Japan is shrinking and getting older. China, I'm sorry, South Korea is shrinking and getting older as well. It's one of the, it too has the same demographic problems. Right. And in the event that either of those countries looks around the region, it should say, it should be thinking of where will we be in five or ten years. Right. And I think, you know, the Japanese should be looking at South Korea and saying, you know, if South Korea makes a deal with China, then we're right. left out. Mm -hmm. And the ja South Koreans should be saying, well, if the Japanese make a deal with China, we're going to be left out. Right. So, and instead, if you look at who we are, we, Japanese, you know, liberal democracies, right. market economies, U.S. allies, trading nations, you know, we're the same size, we face the same, we right. are natural partners. And exactly. that's the deal that they need to make. Yeah. What's really interesting, in the last few months since the Singapore summit, what you've seen is Japanese and Koreans both saying, these Americans are a little, um, you know, this, this suspension of military exercises, that's ah, a little bit much for us. We really need to be th worried that right. the Americans are becoming a little less reliable, and thus we need to start working more closely together. Right. So the, the American withdrawal becomes, if you will, a glue that pulls these, right. these countries together. Right. Let's go to another point before we uh, finish sure. uh, talking about the war trade, uh, U.S. and China. Uh, how, how is that benefit to ASEAN or countries, uh, particularly uh, Cambodia? Well, I, I, in a lot of different ways. I mean, I think, you know, the Trump administration, like the United States, right. uh, before the other, and if you look at the statements of, and, the, and the reports of practically every chamber of commerce, the American Chamber of Commerce, the European Chamber of Commerce, you know, the, the pick your German Chamber, they all have different names, the Japanese, Kadon Ren, whatever, they all look at China and they all say, this is an increasingly unfair uh, market. Right. That we are, you know, exploited, we are, we are, for, we are, we are disadvantaged, and right. that China is not playing fairly. Right. And thus, their changes need to be made. Right. Now, in that world, in theory, all of those countries should be working together through the WTO, through various trade mechanisms, coming together and making a united case against China. And instead, we're picking trade fights with all these other countries. Right. So I think everyone understands that Chinese behavior must change. The question is, how do we bring that about? And the right. only way it's going to happen is if we all get together. How does that matter for ASEAN? Well, the United States and other countries as well are beginning concerned about 
Chinese products in some fields, telecommunications. So, for right. example, the ban on Huawei. Right. What that means is products made in China will no longer be available to be used in these final markets. If you can't make them in China, then that means you have to go elsewhere in ASEAN to get those same components, same parts, same final products. Right. That should be of great advantage for countries like Cambodia, places like Singapore, right. Thailand. They will now become, you know, opportunities, manufacturing sites, assembly sites right. that do not are not subject to the same restrictions and the same restraints. Right. So in some ways, the trade war is not good. I don't mm. think trade wars are ever good. I think it's a mistake. You will see the potential for cascading mm. effects is very, very real. Right. And the potential violence <coughs> to all of our health, welfare, well-being, prosperity is very real. Right. But nevertheless, we should be hoping that the Chinese behavior will change. And I think if China becomes more less predatory, more open, more equal, then obviously what we have uh, is, is a world in which there are a, a better right. distributed sense of opportunities. Right. So every, every war, <coughs> uh, startup, war, number, uh, war one, war two, world war two, something like that, all will come up from the economy. All right, start on that. So now again, uh, to this generation, uh, uh, the trade war between America and China against that. Do you think any sign it, it's going to move to the, the real war, the, the gun war, the, the, the fighting war, or missile war, um, as started from the economy war? I'm, I'm not sure that the, that's uh, the, the perfect explanation for everything. I mean, uh, yeah. there are, it's an important factor. Yeah. I don't think that the, 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 the chief danger that we face in terms of a conflict these days is not of an economic war. The danger that we face is going to be some kind of, you know, literally I think it starts with kinetic behavior. In other words, you have an incident where an American ship and a Chinese ship go bang, where right. a North Korean ship and a South Korean ship and plane go bang, right. by accident perhaps. But nevertheless, because of the tensions, because of the inability to communicate in crises, because of uh, uh, expectations, etc., that things escalate. Right. Um, so I don't anticipate uh, that, that it, there is a chance for conflict. Mm -hmm. I think we, it is non-trivial, but it, it will be one that is really the reflection of military presences and military problems, not that it grows out of, if you will, a trade conflict. Right. That, it, it, that causality, if you will, is too strained. One, one more thing that I want to ask you, um, sure. One Belt, One Road is very big, the ambitious of the uh, physical and Xi Jinping, mm -hmm. and uh, for the next 25, 30 years, it's going to be success. When the China becomes so strong, and then the uh, uh, China thinking that uh, probably they need to revenge to Japan, uh, and, and, and 19th century, right, uh, Japan invade China, uh, Taiwan, or Korea, something like that. Will any chance that, that, according to behavior of China, would China will interested to uh, to revenge Japan or no. go back to uh, no. <laughs> something? No. Just kind of stupid question. No, no, yeah, I think it's a silly question. I think no, of course not. There's no reason to invade Japan. That gains right. nothing. I mean, uh, but what I do think. I, I, there are potentials for clash with Japan. Right. There is the disputed territories in the East China Sea, mm -hmm. the Senkakus, as the Japanese call it, right. the Daiyus, as, as the Chinese do. Um, what I think the, the, the Chinese look at that as, I mean, you know, three issues there, really. Number one, there's the fact that it is, there are resources that they would like to get their hands on, hydrocarbons, which are very important, and thus matter a lot to, to the Chinese economy. Number two, there is the strategic concern, and that is, is that you worry about, as China wants to push its military in the event of a crisis out and away from its borders, that those islands, other islands further to the right. southwest, that they become important choke points for Chinese progress. So the more to control that you have over that, what they call that first island chain, right. the better the Chinese, the less, more freedom that the Chinese have in the event of a military contingency. No, that's what it is. And the third, of course, is just the political issues here. That it, it respond. The fact is, that the Chinese, you know, always talk about the 150 years of humiliation. Right. The fact that these islands are theirs, that were taken from them, and thus there is the political nationalist piece of that puzzle, right. which is symbolic, but that could still be extremely important in Chinese politics. So that is a potential mm -hmm. flashpoint. But invading Japan? Nah, there's no, no point in it. I mean, the, the that, Chinese, that's good the, news. Tell you, if you go to Ginza right now, which right. you know, I uh, live in Tokyo. Right. If you go to China, to, to Ginza, the Chinese. Are have already invaded. Right. All, you hear more Chinese on the weekend than I hear Japanese. All the Chinese tourists are mm -hmm. buying, you know, the products. And, and my, yeah. you know, my wife is, is Chinese, and so she tells me that Tokyo sometimes is cheaper than Shanghai. Right. You know, and, and, and you know that if you go to China, if you go to Japan, the products are better, the food is cleaner, you know, it's safer. So the Jap I think the Chinese like having Japan out there right. as a place to go that they can enjoy. Now they're in the economic, you know, position that they can enjoy right. those things. I heard that the uh, Chinese love to buy a Japanese toilet, right? 
Japanese toilets, Japanese rice cookers. Uh, <laughs> you get on the flight from Shanghai to, to Tokyo and it's right. just full, all the flights, and everybody's carrying bags and bags and bags of stuff. Yeah, maybe one, one last question uh, about, if you don't touch about Cambodia, what is that you, uh, really a uh, US uh, policy to Cambodia? Uh, foreign policy in Cambodia because the kind of like Cambodia is very small, all we have problem with you. How does that happen? Well, I mean, I think what's what's happened over time. I mean, and I'm I'm sorry to say, but there is a belief in many ways mm. that Cambodia has slipped into the Chinese orbit. Right. And I think that there is, uh, you know, uh, that because of the necessary or geographic because of the economy. Uh, I don't think it's necessary. I think it's just happened by way, virtue of the way that the political relationships have worked out. Right. I think you know that anyone that comes to Cambodia appreciates what a beautiful country it is, what right. great potential it has, and would like to see that potential better realized. Um, and I, but I think there's this sense that the political system here is closed. Right. to the United States in many ways, and that it is it has made choices that close off opportunities for American engagement. I think if, you know, if, if American companies could come here and could invest, right. could um, have better, you know, chances to make money, uh, if, if uh, I think you, you, Cambodia should do a little bit more to advertise uh, Angkor Wat, which is gorgeous, you know, and right. the other temples, and I mean, it, it is a, a neat city. But it's one, unfortunately, that the, the optics, if you will, the image right. of Cambodia in much of the world is, is I mean, I mean, how to, how to rebuild, uh, how to rebuild the diplomat between the uh, Cambodia and U.S. Because look, you can ask a uh, hundred thousand Cambodian people; they always want to live in U.S. They always appreciate U.S. We all using dollars in our pockets. Well, yeah, I know, and that's great. I mean, the way you do it, number one, I think, is conferences like the one that I've been attending, right. where they're, they're open, that are a really great chance to have an exchange of ideas, mm -hmm. to hopefully f get more American experts that are engaged with, with that have a chance to, to come here to see what the opportunities, the potential are, to change the thinking of the Cambodian people as well. Right. And then uh, as well to, to make it clear that America is welcome uh, as, a, as a partner. You know? And the right. fact is, is that there are, there are issues with which we, mu we, we disagree, but we must right. agree, you know, disagree, as we say, without being disagreeable. But, and the trick, though, is, is at the end of the day, there are political constraints right. on the relationship. We right. have to, to overcome them. But U.S. demand too much about the uh, human rights and uh, democracy or whatever, which is Cambodia saying that human rights should be after the uh, wealthy, after people have uh, food on the table first or whatever. I, I, find, I, I, I have some sympathy with that argument, uh, the, the Cambodian argument, but I also find that I've in, it is always my experience that people with power, and I don't care if this is in Cambodia right. or for Vietnam or China, or even in the United States, that it's usually the people that are in power that say it's not so important that other people have power too. Right. That, that, that you know, we need to take care of everybody else. And, and once that's done, then we can talk about political developments, which is another way of sort of saying, you know, I never see people, you know, one way to put it is, I never see people that have power saying, you know, it's really not that important to have power, and I'll give it up. Usually it's people that have power right. say, it's not so important that other people right. don't have power. So, you know, it's not that they don't, they don't believe in democracy for other people. Right. So power like, like a beef stick, right? Like a beef in the, uh, the mouth already, you can, you can pull out, right? Right. Yeah, oh. yeah. And so, I mean, it is, it, it is <coughs> the claim that, that people don't want human rights or whatever, and mm -hmm. instead would prefer that, that they want to have food on their table, is usually people that are said by people that have both the rights and the food on the table. Right. And, it's, and, and they're never, you, if you ask them, so are you prepared to give up your rights so that you can have, you know, and we'll give you more food? They're usually not that crazy about the idea. <laughs> now it's time we uh, finish our conversation. Thanks so much, the uh, Brad, uh, for your uh, for your insight. For thank your you so much. For it's for been a pleasure to be here. Hopefully we'll come back and do it again. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate it.